Another organization in the civil rights picture is the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I, oh, I know people say, oh, John, you sure? He was on the front page of Time Magazine. He's a revered leader. Uh, that may be. So was Castro. So was Alger Hiss. You remember what Harry Truman said very naively about Alger Hiss. We have a problem in this country. We don't want to look. What is Martin Luther King's back? Of the Southern Christian leader, L. Shuttlesworth, is a conference educational fund which both the House Committee on Un-American Activities and the Internal Security Committee of the Senate have identified as a major... The field secretary is... He is an identified program director of the Southern... The Reverend Andrew Young, who received his training at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, which was banished from Tennessee by the state legislature for being subversive and communist influence. On Labor Day 1950, was taken of the Reverend Martin Luther King at the Highlander Folk School. The Reverend Martin Luther King wasn't just a participant, as we're told. He was a faculty member. What were they training them for? Internal revolution and demonstrations. And Martin Luther King was one of the major lecturers in how to do this. Now, Mr. King had his picture taken with Miles Horton, director of the school, identified with many Communist Front organizations. Aubrey Root Williams, another Communist Fronter of extensive background. And Abner W. Berry, a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the United States. These were also other members of the faculty. Among other things, Martin Luther King joined with the Internet Elder Workers, which was led by the United States, and the Southern Regional Con Conference for Human Communist-dominated organization by the House Committee on American Activities. Martin Luther King also has, for his organization, insisted that they take money from the Communist Party, and they said, we won't do it. Now, turning to another of the leading organizations, we find the Congress of Racial Equality known as CORE. The national director of this organization is James Farmer. An investigating committee of the Texas House of Representatives in 1961 said he also served as the field secretary, this is Mr. Farmer, for the Student League for Industrial Democracy. This organization visited many, and he was one of its major publication known as Revolt. He said, quote, the League for Industrial Democracy is a militant, socialist educational movement which challenges those who would think and act for a new social order based on production for use and not for profit. This is a revolutionary slogan, says Mr. Farmer. It means that the members think and work for the elimination of capitalism as we know it in America and the substitution for a new socialist world order. End of quote, Mr. Farmer. We then come to Walter and Victor Ruther, who have been extremely active and interested in various organization committees in the so-called civil rights movement. Walter Ruther helped lead the march on Washington. Now remember, Walter and Victor Ruther are the two men who wrote a letter on January 20th, 1934, to Melvin and Gladys Bishop, and they wrote that letter from Russia when they were studying at the Lenin School. By the way, this has been put in the congressional record three times. A copy of that letter, if you'd like. They said, we are witnessing and experiencing great things, socialist republics. Please carry on the fight for a Soviet America, said Walter and Victor Ruther. Now today, Walter Ruther will tell you that he is working for a socialist America, and he devotes a great deal of time and energy to promoting all kinds of civil rights movements all over this country that cause tremendous dissension and internal conflicts of race. Carl Prussiev for the FBI stated recently that Martin Luther King has either been a member of or wittingly has accepted 60 communist fronts, individuals or organizations, which gave aid or comfort to the communist purpose. Prussian attended Santa Clara County, California, Communist Party meetings from 1954 to 1959, at which time he was... In these meetings, a Mr. Ed Beck, known to Carl Prussian as a communist self, is today secretary of the NAACP, San Mateo County. 
Carl Prussian tells us that Ed Beck ordered communists at that time to do as follows, quote, all communists working within the framework of the NAACP are instructed to work for a change of the passive attitude of the NAACP toward a more militant, demonstrative class struggle policy to be expressed by sit-ins, demonstrations, marches and protests of transforming the NAACP into an organization for the achievement of communist objectives. Prussian tells us the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was always set forth as the individual to whom communists should look and rally around struggle on the racial issue. End of quote. We have thus far discussed the emphasis which the Communist Party of the United States has placed upon the domestic civil rights controversy and the extensive leadership positions held by its agents and some of its sympathizers. What do the communists tell us is their strategy in this whole movement? Well, Hyman Loomer, in the editorial of July 1963 in Political Affairs, he said, quote, it is necessary, first, for communists to mobilize all possible support for the administration's civil rights legislation. Its passage will place the role of the federal government in a new light and will thus constitute a major advance for the Communist Party. But it will not occur without an all-out fight. Legislation is no substitute for direct federal intervention in the South, including the use of federal troops. What is called for, then, are bigger demonstrations and especially a mass outpouring on the March on Washington such as has never before been witnessed in the history of this country. It is essential and coordination within the movement itself as a necessary condition for the advancement and to relate other movements and struggles with it. He continued later on, to conclude, a new situation has been created which offers enormous potentiality to the Communist Party for peace and progress in the period ahead. If fully... So here we have it blueprinted for us very clearly by the communists. Civil rights legislation that they want passed. They order it passed. And not only do they order their own members to participate, but they say all members should go out and get leftist and progressive forces to support it too. They also talk about the use of federal troops, mass demonstrations, and unification under communist leadership. What about the... Uh, communist intentions as it relates to the Negro movement. Do they really care about the Negro? We know that the communists do not advocate these policies for the benefit of the Negroes or for any individuals. The late Joseph Kornfeder, a former communist, testified before a joint legislative 1957, and he said, quote, the communists use the Negro of racial dissension and nationalism in order to use the Negro for their purposes. Once they have used him, they will do with the Negro what they have done in Russia or any other country they control with the peasant or the working man. They will dispose of him." End of quote. Now the following testimony was taken from Leonard Patterson, a Negro and a former communist it was taken by a legislative committee on November the 18th, 1959. He said, quote, I left the Communist Party because I became convinced that the Communist Party did not have at heart the interest of the Negro people, the interest of the white people, the interest of the laboring people, the interest of the farmer. That the Communist Party was only interested in promoting among the Negro people a so-called national liberation movement that would in fact aid the Communist Party in its efforts to create a proletarian revolution in the United States and that would overthrow the United States government by force and violence through a bloody full-time revolution and substitute it with a Soviet form of government with a dictatorship of the proletariat. I was taught at the Lenin School and I was taught through the Communist Party channels that there could in fact be no peaceful overthrow of the United States government. It could only be done by a revolutionary force 
led by the Communist Party, end of quote. Now, in support of both of these theses presented by two former communists, J. Edgar Hoover stated on January 16, 1958, he said, quote, the Communist Party's objectives are not to aid the Negroes, but are designed to take advantage of all of the controversial issues on the race question and to create the unrest, the dissension, and the confusion in the minds of the American people, thereby aiding the Communist Party. Therefore, I say, the Communists must see in this civil rights legislation and in the use of federal troops a means of advancing their own influence and control over all Americans, otherwise they wouldn't order their own members to follow this kind of a pattern. Now, what are the past presidents, what do they say? Two past presidents, Lloyd Wright and John Satterfield, have said as follows. This bill is 10% civil rights and 90% extension of federal executive power. If the legislation becomes law, and it is upheld by the courts, it will, one, extend federal power over businesses, industry, and over individuals with a corresponding destruction of state and local governments in a degree that exceeds the total of such extensions of power by all judicial decisions and all congressional actions since the Constitution of the United States was adopted. Two, destroy the constitutional checks and balances between the federal government and state and local governments. Three, it will in fact destroy the constitutional checks and balances branch of the federal government and the legislative and judicial branches. Aspects of this legislation is but a cloak, massive, uncontrolled executive power in one place. Now in contrast to two past presidents of the American Bar Association who ought to have some understanding of legislation, what do the communists say about this legislation? Let's talk about what Clyde Lightfoot has to say about it. He's the secretary of the Communist Party in Illinois. He says, this legislation is the structure of the American form of government is a tremendous obstacle to the rapid advance of the Communist Party. The American government is divided into three power structures, legislative, judicial, and levels of government. All three branches and all three levels of government have certain power canceling out process. This so-called equal distribution of power, says Mr. Lightfoot, is nothing more than a built-in safeguard for a reactionary government and defeats communist purposes. Now, how much more obvious? That's why they're interested in this legislation. They want to destroy our form of government by playing up the egos of over-eager politicians. Is it any wonder, then, that Communist Loomer says in the July 1963 Political Affairs Edition, this legislation will place the role of the federal government in a new light and will thus constitute a major advance for the Communist Party, just as the consolidation of power and authority in Czechoslovakia serve communist purposes for the eventual takeover of that country by subverting the normal police powers within that state at different levels and concentrating it all under the Secretary of the Interior. This is the major objective of the Communist Party in this country today under the guides. The question is whether we will succumb to this People say, well, first, it is important that we not unfairly place the blame on the Negro or the segregationists, but place the blame where it properly belongs, at the feet of the Communist Party of the United States, which constantly works both sides of the street to create the dissension. Understanding and tolerance of proof status will never be achieved by following deceitful communist programs of civil rights, because Marx's ultimate purposes are never what they appear to be on the surface. So, when enough Americans realize that the overwhelming proportion of the civil rights agitation is manipulated from behind the scenes 
we can then truly approach the problems of any minority group in this country with rationale and real understanding. We can also then achieve real progress on a voluntary basis without federal compulsion. Second, those barriers of formal segregation that have already been eliminated should be more positively known to the people of this country and should be played up in the press. All the status of the Negro and his achievement in this country should be made more. There are many Negroes in this country and have done it without the help of federal government. Jesse Owens didn't win the 100-yard dash just because there were Chinese Indians or white people in the race. That had nothing to do with it. It was his willingness to achieve greatness in the field. It had nothing to do with the federal government. And so what we are saying is that there must be given more publicity to those areas where there has been real achievement. Then it will be more difficult for the Communist Party to stimulate discontent and make the Negro or any other minority race feel they're downtrodden when in fact they have a better opportunity in this country than any other country in the world. For instance, the combined wealth of the 20 million Negroes in this country is five times as great as the combined wealth of the Negroes of the entire rest of the world. An ability to get ahead. Why isn't that played up in our press instead of some of the other aspects that are constantly drummed into our head and made us to believe that we're all guilty of depriving all minorities of things that they don't have. That isn't true. I say that the proper needs, and there are needs of the Negro, will be received enlightened attention when we show both sides of the story and not just the bad aspects. Third, let's give specific support to those institutions and organizations that treat all Americans on an equal basis economic support and moral support for those organizations that conduct fair business practices on a voluntary basis can receive the day-to-day -day votes of those who purchase goods in a free enterprise system. Fourth, I think we should encourage all Negro people, all minorities, all Americans to approach these problems on the basis of self-improvement, self-education, it isn't who you go to school with, it's how you use the facilities you've already got. All Americans should heed the word of a very fine Negro by the name of James Hood. This is the man that was the first male Negro to enroll at the University of Alabama. And I think he's properly stated the case for all of us. He said, quote, why doesn't the Negro race wake up and go about this thing in a more intelligent way? Who benefits from all these conflicts in the street? The Negro masses or the Negro leader who's really seeking publicity? There must be a more positive way of achieving first-class citizenship, a way without violence or protests. There must be more time spent in the classrooms and less time wasted on the picket lines. I think it has become a matter of excitement rather than conviction with some of the Negroes in these movements." End of quote. Manning Johnson, another Negro, who by the way was in the hierarchy of the Communist Party because he really thought the Communist Party was going to help his race. And he defected from the Communist Party and wrote a book. It's called Color, Communism, and Common Sense. I hope you'll get a copy of that book. It gives you a wonderful understanding of how the communists have, in fact, dominated the civil rights movement in this country. Manning Johnson says in this book and contributes to a positive way that you and I can help all minorities. To, in other words, the Negro, all Americans, should be encouraged to make full use of the educational facilities already available, and especially to make full use of this wonderful free enterprise system in the traditional American way by doing it yourself. Other minority groups have achieved this sense of advancement and personal achievement without using all of the deplorable tactics of the Communist Party to help them along. 
Fifth, I think we should oppose the civil rights bill with all the effort we can muster. This country was founded on the concept that there is a God and he is available to every single citizen. Our founding fathers felt this was an important aspect and so important they included it in the Declaration of Independence and made provision for it in the Constitution. That this was the spiritual foundation of our country. The best way that you and I can help any minority group is to encourage them to make use of the spiritual values and powers inherent in this whole philosophy of our country. This can give the vigor, the enthusiasm, the ability, the talent to get ahead. He doesn't need the federal government because the federal government is not God yet. The overwhelming majority of American people have a great deal of sympathy and more important, genuine respect for the Negro or any other minority group or for that matter, any other American citizen who are trying to better their lot. But let us as individuals not be stampeded by a communist created crisis or especially by a communist created solution which in the long run never bring positive results in any field. Thank you very much.